Hey this is Sayyam Botani and you're listening to Chai Time Data Science a podcast for data science enthusiasts where i interview practitioners researchers and calculators about their journey experience and talk all things about data science Welcome to another episode of ctdas.show. In this episode, I interview one of my first teachers from the Udacity Nano Degrees. A few of you might know I've taken a lot of courses online. In this episode, I interview Dr. Luis Serrano, who's an amazing content creator and currently a quantum AI research scientist at Zapata Computing. In this episode, we talk about Luis's process of creating the amazing videos by the way you should really check them out Luis creates these amazing very intuitive and easily approachable materials for anyone to enjoy on his youtube channel we talk about his process of creating this his his journey of teaching thousands i believe now millions of people through his content we also discuss about his book his upcoming book titled grokking machine learning which is as you might expect aim for anyone who's interested in machine learning there are no prerequisites and if you watched any of luis's videos which i hope you might now luis follows the similar trend of creating amazing analogies and these are really helpful uh, to help you get started or get a better understanding of different materials this interview is filled with different golden advices that i think someone with luis's background of having taught so many people would have thanks to manning publication there will also be a giveaway of five books to participate and simply retweet the tweet along with which this episode is released without further ado here's my conversation with one of my favorite youtubers favorite machine learning deep learning or ai cre- content creators luis sarano please enjoy the show I am really excited to be talking to one of my first teachers of machine learning one of my first teachers of deep learning through the Udacity Nano degree Luis Serrano Luis thank you so much for joining me on the podcast Thank you so much for having me Sanya it's an honor to be here uh, so I I have a lot of questions I I call these stupid questions I have a lot of stupid questions to ask you but first I want to start yes. by talking about your journey uh, you started with uh, you followed the traditional path in academia in mathematics Uh, were you always drawn to math and academia uh, why did you follow that path and how did machine learning come into the picture yeah i was always in the math uh, path and i wanted to be a professor uh, and i sort of just just followed the natural path you to undergrad masters phd postdoc and then but then somewhere somewhere in the process just uh, things were clicking different you know i think uh, the the research world i, I wasn't um, that drawn to to pure math research I I was but not so much I I enjoyed the teaching more I enjoyed other things um I started doing programming uh, I started for my own research right mm-hmm. uh I started noticing that the, you know the academic market is 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 tough and it was going to you know require moving around a lot require maybe waiting like this this going from postdoc to professor is is a hard step and I started getting interested in other things coding more so i i i decided yeah maybe i'll i'll just make a switch and and start something new and and see what happens so i went to uh i started learning taking online courses so that's why i have so much love for for online courses because i i did on you know algorithms machine learning all that and and that's how i uh switched to silicon valley and and never looked back <laughs> fascinating uh, i want to read out a few words from your channel uh, i i being you uh, i believe education is tremendously important and i believe every human deserves a world class education mm-hmm. were the roots uh, to this idea always there in your mind uh, throughout your phd were you also interested in teaching did you take any lectures at that time 
Yes, I did. I did. I, I was I was very lucky that I got to TA a lot, and um, it's in the place where I was, University of, of Michigan. They had an interesting thing in the math department where you weren't a TA, you were a teacher, a full time teacher. So instead of having a you know lecture with three hundred people and one professor and a bunch of TAs, what they had is uh, thirty little lectures, and each grad student which teach them completely. So and they were longer. So I had four and a half hours per week of teaching with 30 students. And, and, and there was a lot of teaching inter interactive by groups and stuff like that for my entire PhD. So I got, there was so much practice teaching that, that, I, that, that I had that just the start of luck that I really enjoyed that part. I, I, I always enjoyed the teaching. I always enjoyed giving, giving lectures, giving talks about research. I, I enjoyed it a lot. I never thought too much of it. I never thought uh, actively about education. I just enjoyed it like a hobby. You know, it was later in life that I that I got into to really understanding and appreciating what education can do to the world. I see. Uh, and uh, you mentioned you transitioned into the industry right around that point. Uh, how was that transition for you? And uh, I believe your first job out of academia was at Google. Uh, what tasks yeah. were you working on? Uh, you, you started with working on YouTube. Was that your secret that you knew yeah. the insights to the <laughs> recommendation engine? <laughs> I wish. I think I wish I knew more, <laughs> uh, more <laughs> tricks on the recommendation engine. The transition was, was not easy. I went from pure mathematics uh, to many new things, like how does a company work? That, that was new for me. How to write code. I could write code but i couldn't write the you know the kind of code at google is very different like i'd write code for my own in my own local thing and, and so to, that that jump was was tough uh i went into the in, into youtube just uh you know I, I i applied for google a friend referred me and then he was in that team so he recommended me for that team and i ended up being in a machine learning team i barely knew machine learning but i was i was in the process of learning and uh, yeah, the recommendations team at YouTube, I really enjoyed it. I mean, I think, uh, as I said, the work was tough and I had to, to learn things from scratch that, you know, the 20-year-old intern right by me knew more. And so I had, um, I was working late. I, I was on the weekends because it was um, completely new for me. Uh, and uh, yeah, I, I really, that's where I really learned. Most of the things that I teach, I, I learned them during that time. And uh, yeah, I mean, I, I, I do find it very interesting that now I put videos on YouTube and I benefit from what my team did because when I was there, you see a lot of numbers. Like I was like, oh, okay, we made this model mm -hmm. and then increased watch time by this much and then number of creators and this and that. But I never saw it from the eyes of a creator. And mm -hmm. getting your own videos recommended is, is amazing because the, the, the the traffic that I get for the videos, uh, the majority is is from internal recommendations. So I have a new appreciation for my uh, for my old team. <laughs> you didn't have a channel at that point, I believe it was it was after that that the channel was created. Yeah, I started the channel. I actually just started putting videos first to because I, I started applying to like places, educational places, and some of them required like send a video or something. So that's how I started putting some basic videos but then it got more it got more elaborate later when i okay. when i was yeah maybe i'll tell you more <laughs> yeah. sure uh, one of the themes that i uh, and i'm sure you get uh, asked this question a lot uh, students who are just new to this don't realize that there's a different pipeline to getting a job as well uh, if you could for once answer their question on how should they approach applying to job roles or how should they try to get their first break into the field? Yeah, I think it's very important to get your, your code out and, and your thing. So having a GitHub profile is, is very important. I would say more and more, I mean, in an ideal world to me, a GitHub profile is more important than what diplomas you have. Hmm. I think right now there's, you know, they're, they're hopefully at a closer level of importance than, than before. But when I interviewed somebody, I, I would always, if they have GitHub links, I would look at their code, look, go through the repos, like look at other things they do. That's very important. Uh, things like Kaggle competitions are very important uh, because they give you projects, right? Normally in yeah. an interview, you, you would ask, um, 
tell me about a machine learning project that you did. Okay, how did you do this part? How did you do testing? How, what, uh, what models did you use and why? What optimizers did you use and why? Like, so this, this can only, you can only answer these questions if you have thoroughly gone through a project yourself and, and evaluated data yourself. So that, that stuff is very important. Um, other things, I mean, if you have the opportunity of, of getting, you know, for education, like a master's or something, fantastic. If you don't, it's not needed. Online courses are very important. I, I've done all my, all my, all my technology education has been online courses. So all that is important and throw yourself out there. Uh, not applying to the job is the, the guaranteed way to not get it. <laughs> uh, apply to things, apply to internships, just, you know, just have a resume, maybe read up or try to get help on, on making a nice resume because a recruiter may take five seconds reading it, you know? Yeah. Uh, and uh, you just apply, 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 because many people say, oh, I'm not qualified for this job and I don't apply. But then, you know, somebody who just, so, so many people apply to them, uh, you know, you just, you just got to aim high. So that's sort of my advice. Yeah, also do a lot of networking as much as possible. Right now that with COVID, you don't need to be in a place to do mm -hmm. networking. Like do, you know, add people on LinkedIn, send them messages. Many may not reply, but many may. Uh, go to go to as many things as you can. If you were blessed to be in a place where where there's talks and things like that, go to go to talks, go to events. Uh, if not, go to things online. Reach out and uh, reach out to friends if you have friends in in companies. Uh, referrals are the best way. I got to Google with using a referral. Um, reach out to your friends that have yeah that that could refer you, and they they normally. Uh, a referral can be can can do make get your feet in the door, in front of the door much quicker, and uh, it also helps the person who did the referral because if you get hired, they get money. So never be shy to to ask your friends for referrals, and uh, have a good LinkedIn profile. I think people do look at those. All those things, networking is is very important. So don't be don't be shy to network. Totally. Uh, I wanted to mention one aspect. One thing that I really learned is your YouTube channel. Uh, I I'm biased, but I would ask the audience to check that out before going okay. along the route of doing a master's. And on the topic of networking, I remember uh, you had done a live stream a month or two ago, and you were literally answering every single question in the live stream when you had hit 50,000 subscribers. So quite literally on the internet, you, you get to meet people like Lewis himself at these days. Thank you. Yeah, yeah, it's fun. That live stream was fun. I started it, ran, I, I decided to kind of go in and, <laughs> and people went in and started having a really awesome chat. So those things are, are great. And then I met a lot of people through that, like people who just uh, talked to me in the chat and then they messaged me later and then we had a one-on-one. -on -one and things like that. Yeah. Uh, now continuing uh, the questions about your journey, uh, I know you joined Udacity later. I was the first student, as I was mentioning uh, offline, one of the first students in the first batch of deep learning, not the absolute first student. That's wonderful. Uh, what all courses did you teach? Uh, I know uh, I, you, you've taught a lot of courses. Maybe the materials are reused in some different nano degrees, but uh, what tasks did you work on and uh, what all nano degrees did you contribute to? Yeah. Um, yeah, the Udacity was a great experience. Um, I think my, my material ended up in different places that I, that I never, you know, just you gets used a lot. So there, there may have been more, but when I started, the first task I had was machine learning. So I I redid some things in the machine learning nano degree. I added uh, some initial introductory material. That was the first thing I did at Udacity, and then I got swapped to the UI, to the AI nano degree, which doesn't exist anymore. There was an AI nano degree, so I made some material there on constraint optimization and things like that, and then. Uh, those were minor material. Then when, when I got into, uh, then I was given the role of the deep learning nano degree elite. So I started, I, 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 and, and there was a big, uh, that was a big launch and everything. So I was giving a ton of resources and things like that. And I had an entire team. Uh, and so that's when we started building a lot of material. So the, the stuff you saw on the on neural networks was that. Hmm. We built deep, a deep neural network section and uh, that gets used a lot because everything uses deep learning. So we, we, we try to make everything like Legos, right? Yeah. So 
you have a Lego block and then people come in with knowing something and you, you, you kind of specify what they're supposed to know and what they know at the end. And then every time there's deep learning needed, they just put that chunk there and maybe put some transitions. So self-driving car nano degree had that chunk of deep learning. And I think finance had that chunk of deep learning and it gets used a lot. And I, I'm very happy that it gets used a lot because I, I left you that, but I still see it appearing in places. And then after that, then we really got into rebuilding machine learning nano degree. And so then with a similar team, we just started and, and, and rebuilt it from the basics. So all of supervised learning, all of unsupervised learning, then we built some reinforcement learning that wasn't built by me, but it was built by great, somebody who was great. Uh, I, and I aided a little bit on that sort of to, to connect it to the deep learning. So it was a lot of, I did a lot of managing at the end and, and sort of high level, like, okay, you build this, you build this, we put them together. Then I build a little bit here. So at the beginning, it was a lot of teaching. And at the end, it was a lot of playing with puzzle pieces. Yeah, it was fun because I learned a lot of from others. I, 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 I had taken a total of five or six nano degrees at a stretch. Ooh, and I remember congratulations. Up, <laughs> thank you. Quite a I, I remember the boxes would already be, already be checked because those materials would reappear. So that, that was a lot of fun. Yeah. <laughs> I'm I'm curious at Udacity you had worked with uh, I think a complete production team their production quality is uh, amazing I, I anyone yeah. who's taken the courses knows that and you've also created these uh, tutorials by yourself for your channel yeah. I don't see any difference to be honest in in the oh, level uh, thank you. Yes. that's across <laughs> thank you. Uh, how, how do you see both of these processes is it a natural connect uh, do you enjoy making content by yourself is it a different pipeline uh it's actually very similar. The, the reason I started getting better at Keynote is because I had a hard time with, uh, like the, we had a, in Ejacity, there was, a, as you said, a very elaborate process and they had great animators that would just turn your stuff into magic. And so what they said is, you know, you have to put a script and you have to draw some, every creator had a sort of different approach, but I had such a hard time describing what I was going to say and then seeing the process back and I'll be like, no, that wasn't it. Mm -hmm. Sorry, can you try this? And one day I said, okay, I just clearly cannot describe my things very well. Why don't I just make it as, as uh, perfect as possible in the keynote, give you that, and then you, they turn it into, into pretty, like they would make the animation smooth and stuff like that, but the basis was there. So I started doing that and turned out that that was easier for me and for, um, for them to understand what I was saying and for me to, to sort of make it clear. And so I started doing that. And then sometimes that we, we were in a rush and there was no time sent to the animator, we would just put the one I, I did, right? Directly and I would be like, that's fine. We can animate it later, but we need to launch the nano degree and this is similar. Yeah. So that's when I got, and I, I enjoyed it, I, I think. I, <laughs> and so I to that in my channel, I, I just put like the, the keynote uh just just put like a keynote animation and i i enjoy making it really pretty and as much as i can just as <laughs> it uh, like i said i don't see any production di uh, difference oh, I, i'm in the world of content creation many people don't realize how much process goes into scripting into editing into animating that's a yeah. different world and yeah uh, I really wanted to highlight this topic i read on the faq of your website uh sarano.academy for anyone mm -hmm. from the audience, which is that you simply used Keynote for up until recently for animating most of the stuff. And people would imagine it'll take a full blown team, uh, a lot of efforts, maybe complete different scripting languages. And that's not the case. Thank you. Thank you. Yeah. I've been wanting to learn some more uh, advanced things. Some, sometimes I have something mathematical that hmm. I would just love to have a, you know, so I, I use, I use other things, but mostly, mostly Keynote and yeah, but I've been, I've been wanting to do some more. Maybe put some time and invest some time into it. Awesome. Uh, yeah. Coming coming to the next step in your journey, I'm really sort of connecting the dots and uh, for the audience to learn from you. But uh, you you joined Apple later on as the lead AI yes. educator. Uh, yes. what, what did that entail? And uh, uh, I'm just curious of uh, what what yeah. were you teaching at Apple? Yeah, Apple was very interesting. Uh, I had um. 
I was I was teaching workshops internally. So they they were starting something called Apple. Well, they not started, but they had something called Apple University, and they wanted AI AI content on it. So yeah, I had I was teaching uh, in person courses and and online courses, mostly on machine learning. It was very similar to to what I was doing at. Sorry, Adidas this was but, internal employee facing, right? It's not. Uh, public. Yeah, this was internal employee facing, and then also some consulting. Like I would talk to teams when they had questions, etc. And so I learned. I learned a lot as well, and it was fun to have like a combination of of online and um, and actually teaching. You know, like my dream. You know, to have like thirty or some, some number of, of 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 smart people and just teach them and and try my material with them and. In, in, in real time, right? Because at Udacity, was great. We had great students, but it was delayed. Like I would hear from them later, oh, you mm. should fish this, or I would be on Slack. But to me, seeing the face of the person because they could just be, you know, if they're bored or if they're happy or something like that, that helped a lot and brought me back to my days of academia. So so I enjoyed that. Yeah, that was, that was fun. Um, I really wanted to connect these dots because I remember you used to do these AMAs on Slack, especially with the first few batches later, different people were assigned to do that. But one thing you've uh, noticed that students, may, maybe a few advices or mistakes uh, to students who are just starting out. And I'm sure you've uh, mentored people from different levels of experience. Uh, what's one advice you want them to hear or what's one mistake that you notice them making? Mm-hmm. Yeah, I, I find that I mean, one thing is one piece of advice that you hear from experts, um, which I, I don't disagree, but I disagree in the way it's put. It's, they say you have to really, to know machine learning, you have to really know a lot of math and a lot of programming and it has to be super solid and then you can do machine learning. And I, I think, yes, you do need to learn these things, but not before, but as you go. You know, yeah. I believe many times people see something and they don't, Oh, I'm not going to be able to do that until I go back and learn all these things. And no, no, I think, I think you can start working on, you know, first of all, pick whatever you like. Like if you like to build a self-driving car, like start with the self-driving car. And then if you need something, go learn it. Right. The moment you need a particular package, go learn it. A particular math thing, go learn it. But with that motivation, because if you learn it without motivation, if I go learn a bunch of linear algebra without knowing how it's going to help, it's, it's actually nicer if I, if I bump into the thing and then I go, okay, I need to learn this fully motivated with the application. Yeah. So I think that that tends to work uh, better for people. So lose that sort of fear uh, and go for what you want first. I think that's kind of how I tried. And of course, different things were for different people. So not meant, you know, but, but for me, it's, it's worked like that. And I noticed that many students get stopped by that fear of, oh, I'm not fully ready for this. Yeah, yeah, you are. So just, just jump for it. I remember I, so I was in my sophomore uh, year of undergrad at CS, which really means nothing. Uh, they don't teach you a lot in, in CS degrees, uh, contrary to beliefs. And I was so terrified I'd almost applied for a refund because I'd signed up for the uh, deep learning nano degree out of interest. And then I mm-hmm. saw the uh, prerequisites, which is linear algebra. Oh, I think I had failed that. <laughs> and a series of more requirements, which I wasn't sure if I knew. But it turns out uh, I was able to ask a lot of questions and learn them along the way, like you mentioned. Absolutely. Absolutely. Yeah, I think, I think requirements are there to sort of, you know, say like things that will make it easy for you, but should never get stopped by a requirement because you can always, uh, yeah, you can always learning on the way and it's, it's probably much better that way. I'm still find myself learning math and lear- learning new things in linear algebra that I either forgot or never learned properly or something as I go when I need it, you know? That's inspiring. Yeah. Um, coming to your current job, you're working at uh, Zapata Computing Inc. Mm-hmm. Uh, you- as a quantum AI research scientist, I uh, would love to know yeah. what does that mean and what tasks are you working on on a non-pandemic day? What does a day in your life look like? Yeah. Oh, yeah, no, I love it. I love it at Zapata. Um, we have a, it, it's like a, a, a platform to, um, to run quantum uh, algorithms, right? So I'm working on a bit of that and working on the running the, the machine learning algorithms. 
So basically, we're developing de developing the machine learning, the, the the quantum version of algorithms. So I have to look. We have to look at what the classical one does and how can you enhance it a little bit, right? Uh, deciding where what battles to pick, right? Like, where should I go for these algorithms or or those? Uh, some of them are like the classical, the the simple ones, right? Like regression or something. They they work very well in classical land. So mm. enhancing those maybe is not the the priority right now. But things that are more uh, complicated, like generative models or things like that, they're studying a lot of those. So I I study a lot of the classical side to understand it well look at what can be enhanced in the, in the quantum side and yeah, and just work on the platform, different things. And uh, a lot of my work also is also like explaining things. I mean, I, I always gravitate to that no matter what you put me <laughs> to. So I uh, get into, you know, yeah, I, ex, ex, my, my, my goal at the end is I want to explain quantum computing and quantum machine learning to, to the world. And for that, I have to understand that first. So hopefully do similar to do similar to what I've been doing in machine learning, get do it in do it in quantum. So hopefully you'll start seeing a bunch of quantum material in, <laughs> in the near future. Really look yeah. forward to seeing those videos on your channel. Uh, Thank you. I, I, I think uh, it's it's an interesting way to uh, and to um, through your honest uh, journey, like you you you've learned these techniques and now you're also applying them in a different field and then teaching us what you learned. Thank you. Yeah, I love teaching because that's the way I really learn. Like if I have to learn, most of the videos you see are stuff that I'm currently learning. Like I, I must have understood it two weeks before the video or, 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 still, or still understanding it as I'm, as I'm recording it. So this is a journey into my own learning. And I find that sharing it with others is, first of all, is rewarding. And second of all, it helps me with, with my own learning. So everybody wins. Yeah. What? <laughs> What does a pipeline for your channel look like today? Of course, you have this a very rich experience of mentoring so many people. Uh, but many people don't realize that uh, a lot of different uh, efforts or a different pipeline goes in behind every single video. What does a video creation pipeline for you look like? Yeah, it could take a long time. Uh, the most it takes me is understanding the material. So I normally just find that thing step is saying okay i do not understand this particular thing i'm gonna have to understand it so then i take a while my goal is to come up with the simplest possible example that captures the complexity so if it's a neural network maybe a one with a couple of neurons and a couple of layers you know a data set can be maybe four points or ten points or something small and I look at the algorithm carefully or I try to apply it in that particular example until I'm happy with it. And there's always a click. It could be, and I could be just having dinner and click. Oh, there's, there's always a point where I'm like, oh, I think I got it. That example works like this. And then it's just beautiful. I can explain it to like a five-year-old. My goal is that, right? And then I try with different people. I try with explaining it to friends uh, who know machine learning or who know math and some who don't at all uh, because that my goal is to sort of find real life scenarios that anybody can understand. You know, I think anybody, everybody knows math and thinks mathematically, but they just, it's a subtraction what, hmm. what some people have and some people don't. But, but if I am able to explain it in a, conc in a concrete way to somebody and, and, and then most people have the capacity to understand the most complex things if you, if you put them if you remove the, the layers and layers of abstraction. And so I tried that. And when I have that, I start, then I start with the actual process. So I normally have a few things going on in my head at the time and some never get crystallized and et cetera. <laughs> and then when I start creating it, I, I start making the slides because to me, they, the picture is the best thing. So I start creating the animations. And once I have all that, I, I redo them. I Sometimes I understand it better and I just throw it away and start again. That may take maybe on average a, a month or something, two weeks to mm -hmm. a month, depending on how many times I, I, get, I throw it all and, and start and get frustrated and restart. And then once I have that, then I'm ready to record. So I start, um, I, I normally, this is one thing that I learned at Udacity that is I, I have a hard time writing what I'm going to say. 
some people are great at that. Some people can just write it and then read it. And it sounds like them. It doesn't sound like me if I, if I write it and read it. But I sometimes just say it. I used, to, I used to say it and then record it and then type what I recorded. Now I can sort of go through the slides and, and say it myself and then, and then kind of write it down as I go. And so I write a script. And then after I write the script, then I, I record it by little pieces in a, in a keynote. And then I join them together in iMovie. Hmm. And then that's it. Then I have the video. So one to two months takes me from, from the moment I start the slides to the moment I have the video. But because I don't do it full time, I, uh, yeah. I, I do it on the weekends or something. But understanding something takes me takes me could take me years could take me months could take me yeah just just wanted to point uh especially the part of of the efforts how much effort it takes uh to the audience because i, I think many people get this urge uh, oh i'm not creating enough blog posts i'm not for people that venture into yeah. this world of creating videos i'm not creating enough videos but it, it takes a lot of efforts especially uh when you're trying to create something really nice and I've, I've uh, watched almost all of your videos, as I was mentioning offline as well. Uh, you create these amazing animations along with very intuitive analogies and uh, you create alternate worlds for Euclidean <laughs> relationships where you mentioned the world is slanted, the, the pixels slanted. are just four yeah. kinds. Uh, and that's, that's, uh, that's a creative process that really takes some time or sometimes a lot of creativity as well. Thank you. Yeah. I try to, the, the good thing is that I always, whether I make videos or not, that's how I try to understand things. So I always try to myself put it, the simplest scenario. So in, in anything, in anything, but it, it, when I was studying math, actually back in the day, I, I would always try to understand things like that. I'm like simplest possible. Okay. You gave me an M by N matrix. What happens on a two by two matrix? What happens on this one? One, mm. two, three, four, like, I always tried that and, and, and I always explain everything to myself with analogies. I don't know, society things with like a small analogy, like all, <laughs> all the things I, I always, because otherwise I don't understand them. So it comes for free a little bit that, that I have that urge that I just, even, even if I had no purpose of, 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 for work or for making a channel, like I, if I'm alone in my thoughts, I'm normally just trying to bring something down so I get it. <laughs> so, yeah. uh, it's like, like you mentioned, uh, everyone can be interested in math, but uh, you need some abstraction. No one, uh, to, to a majority of the people, it's it's not as easy to just read the uh, Greek notations and be able to figure out what's going on. Yeah. So we we're grateful uh, that we get to witness these uh, amazing abstractions. Thank you. Yeah, no, no, nobody has more pro more more trouble with abstraction than me. I, and I don't say it to, you know, pretend or they, this is very, I, I have a hard time with abstraction. I, when I look at formulas, I get lost and I need to, I need to do it concretely. So like studying math was actually very hard. Like I had to, I had to have an, like doing research, for example, took me a long time. It was, I was slower than my peers because they could look at a formula and then start working with that formula and getting things out of it. And I had to, I had to bring it down. Otherwise I couldn't work with it. Coding was also much slower for me when I was working as a programmer. Like I would take much longer because I would be like, I have to understand each line of code and get the picture. Otherwise I, it wouldn't, I wouldn't be physically able to, to do things. So I found that all those difficulties with, with abstraction made it easier for me to, to teach and so I'm, I'm thankful for that but for a while i, I was just like oh, I'm, I'm, maybe i'm just slower than everybody <laughs> yeah. that's that's a very honest uh admission uh but i i, I think uh, many people miss out on the fact that even experts they they take a lot of time to learn and there's, there's a learning process for everyone absolutely uh, yeah. this this allows me to transition uh, into talking about the book uh I, I think this is the first time you're investing into creating some written content uh, what's that process like and can you tell us more about the book title, uh, Grokking Machine Learning? Yeah, yeah, the book has been a great experience. Uh, I, when I was approached to write the book, I thought, ooh, that's, uh, that's interesting. I, I, I mean, I said I, I wanted to, 
but I I know that my way of explaining is is much more visual and hand wavy, and I I, I want to go like you know, and so writing the book has been really interesting because I need to rethink my thoughts a lot. Like I can make a video in five minutes and explain something, but then that that doesn't translate to like a short explanation in a book that needs to you need to be proper. Uh, so it's forced me to to be much more concrete with my thoughts and be more precise. And so it's been it's been a wonderful experience. It it takes me a while to put something in writing, but it it really has sort of shaped my thinking in a slightly different way that uh, I've been thankful. Interesting. Yeah. Uh, who's the book for? Can can uh, everyone expect similar? Uh approach uh, to how you create the videos for literally anyone who's interested in machine learning and anyone who's interested pick up the book and get started my goal is that to have everybody who's interested in machine learning i i don't want it to be just for people who's taken a lot of math and that's why i try to not have the the not have all the formulas also also i don't want it for people who are expert coders hmm. but i do want that if somebody comes in with a lot of math and or a lot of coding that they still enjoy the book so what i try to do is bring everything down to concepts so the book every chapter is a different algorithm and for every algorithm i have a story so the the story with for example the perceptron algorithm is i have some aliens living in a distant planet that you have just visited and they say things to you, but they, you don't know what they say. And they only have two words that are, for example, like ack and beep, for example. And you have to figure out if they're sad or happy based on what they say to you. And you have some information about some aliens being sad or happy based on what they say. So you have to start figuring out what the words mean or at least if the alien is sad or happy based on what they said. So I have a very simple example, like four aliens or something and a couple of words, that's sentiment analysis, right? Now, it's, it's, people don't need to know matrices or to know algebra or to know calculus or gradient descent to understand the concept of trying to understand what a word means, right? Yeah. So we go from there and then I start drawing some plots right? Because everybody can see it and understand what a plot is. And if you see some points that are red on one side and green on the other side, and you draw a line that cuts them, anybody can understand that. So I try to go as far as I can into things that everybody can understand. And somebody from math who, who knows a lot of math can still get benefit from that because sometimes they just say, oh yeah, that's, that's a picture of what's been in my mind for a long time, right? And people appreciate that. People appreciate when they have a a formula in their mind and you draw a picture of it and put it in front of them, right? So I feel like that's for everybody. Uh, there are times where I need to, to write logarithms or where I need to write things. And, and sometimes I say, okay, well, this is how you quantify this. Um, but I try to put it either, either in an appendix or you know, as, as, as late as possible because I, I really stick to concepts. And so, yeah, I think it's, it's mostly a one size uh, a one size fits all, but it's, it's particularly guided to somebody who says, I want to learn machine learning, but I don't have years and years of experience in, in math and programming. And I, st I still want to understand the concepts and that's, that's what I'm aiming for. Pretty much an outsider. And, uh, I, I was, I was really happy because I, I dived into the early access program. I, Manning oh, has yeah. it up on early access for the audience okay, that wants great. to check it okay. out. And I, I was so happy that I, I was worried, uh, will Lewis have the similar analog analogies in a book? Is that even possible? And I, I was really happy to see them. Oh, but thank you. Thank you. <laughs> for, for the audience who uh, wants to check it out, can you give us a highlight of the book? What all does it cover? What all topics do you cover? And uh, what can one expect out of the book? Yeah, yeah, definitely. Uh, the, the, it has, as I said, every, every chapter has a particular algorithm and they're all supervised learning. So I may, maybe in the future I'll write on, on supervised or something like that. But uh, so there, so the chapters are uh, there's one on the linear regression, the perceptron algorithm, logistic regression, uh, the, uh, naive decision base. trees, naive Bayes. Yes, thank you. Decision trees, support vector machines, 
uh, ensemble methods like uh, add a boost or random trees or XGBoost, and then um, neural uh, and neural networks. Yeah, ne neural networks is a chapter two, and then there's each each chapter has its its sort of story. So it's an analogy that that I follow through, and then I go through like geometrical explanations or or probabilistic, you know, if, whatever it is. Um, and then every chapter has code. So the beginning of chapters, you develop the code. So for example, we write the linear regression program from scratch, like how to write linear regression from, from scratch. And it doesn't use calculus, no calculus at all. It just uses <laughs> uh, just a small step that turns, takes your line a little closer to one of the points. And then just picks a random point every time and you can see it working, right? Then afterwards, you know, by the time you get to things like decision trees, coding that is hard and, and, and by then you just kind of want to use a package. So at some point I introduce the packages and I say, this is scikit-learn, this is, uh, you know, packages for, for uh, uh, neural networks, things like that, because you don't want to, you don't want to write every algorithm, you know, it's, it's a line of code at the end of the day. So then we switch the packages. And then I also have some chapters on machine learning techniques. So we have things like uh, regularization, things like testing, training and testing, um, you know, uh, ways to measure overfitting, underfitting, uh, evaluations for, for class classification, things like what's the difference between precision and recall, uh, accuracy, uh, all those things are um, the ROC, the, the um, curve, the, the metrics that tell you how good your model is, because if you only focus on what the algorithms are, people go and apply them and they, they don't work. So you also need techniques on how to make your algorithm better. And then I also have like a, a full walkthrough of, uh, with, a, with a known data set from the beginning to the end, saying this is how you train it, this is how you, this is how you test it, this is how you clean it up, this is how you select the features, all the way to training a bunch of models and doing things like grid search, doing things like, it just kind of covers, it's, it's kind of a one-stop shop for, for machine learning techniques in, in, a, in a friendly way, basically. Mm -hmm. uh, where do you suggest uh, people who have gone through the book, uh, where should they go next or what should they do next uh, in their journey? Ah, great, yeah, great question. Um, I think, I mean, I think they should, if they wanna get a job as a, uh, data scientists, they, they, sh they can immediately apply after that to jobs. Other things to do, maybe uh, do Kaggle competitions. Like I, I encourage people to look at things on Kaggle. And I'm like, try, try this method on some competitions. So those, those are always helpful because they turn the sort of beginner into an expert. It's like- I, At first you might uh, be disappointed though. <laughs> I just want to point that out. <laughs> the, oh, okay. <laughs> Uh, yeah, but but anyway, I I, I um, sort of encourage people. You, they can go to maybe take more online courses, maybe take more advanced things. Uh, definitely, the, the book teaches supervised learning. So if they want to learn on supervised learning, if they want to learn reinforcement learning, generative learning, anything like that, I I encourage them to do so. Go more on the practice side. Go more on the theory side. Go to the workforce. Just just anything that. Anything that people enjoy, I think following whatever you enjoy more is the is the right way to to go. The key advice for me there was uh, people think of an ideal data scientist. They read these blog posts which says a data scientist should know Docker, uh, all of that system admin stuff. They should know stats. They should be a Kaggle master or grandmaster. And uh, you you mentioned or you highlighted that even after reading this book, which is more geared towards beginners, they can start applying. Uh, and people don't realize that the learning doesn't stop uh, after completing a course, a book, or a, getting a job. It it continues throughout their journey. Yeah, absolutely. Uh, the last thing you said, yes, very is very true. Learning should always continue. You should always, always be learning. And uh, yeah, for the for the uh, beginning, it's 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 a misconception. I think yeah, people do think that a data scientist needs to know all those things, and the, all those are not not needed. You need to you need to know a little bit of everything, but you need to pick your battles. I mean, data science is such a diverse, is such a huge field, and and diverse in terms of knowledge, that it's it's hard to be an expert on all the things. 
I'm certainly not an expert in all the things. The technical stuff always be hard. My strength is the math, but even then I, there's a lot of big gaps that I'm constantly trying to fill. And uh, yeah, so people people always come from from their own strengths. Some people are very strong technically. Some people are very strong in statistics. Some people, even the business side, some people need to be good at that. The, the people side, the sort of like, intuition that people have to turn a reality problem into uh in, into a code or into math all those are different skills and at the end of the day you need to be strong you need to see which ones you're strong at which normally are the ones you enjoy the most and kind of capitalize with those and then make sure you learn all the other ones right because getting discouraged by saying well i don't know that much about Docker images as that other person. Yeah, well, maybe they know they don't know that much statistics as you, or maybe they don't know that much. Like, it's it's so many skills that just as long as you say, "Hey, I'm ready to learn things that I don't know," and focus on, you know, use use my strengths as as leverage. I think that makes the perfect data scientist. So jumping into the workforce is what I think is is the most important thing and people are much more ready for it than, than they think. That's an amazing advice to end the interview on. But uh, uh, so uh, uh, usually I interview, uh, end the interviews on, on the advice of, uh, on the question of what's your best advice. I think you've already shared a lot for beginners. Uh, just out of curiosity, how did you end up starting the YouTube channel? And uh, do you recommend creating content uh, to beginners as a process of, of learning or just, just as a contribution to the community? Ah, yes, thank you. Yeah, no, I, I definitely um, I definitely encourage people to show their knowledge. Yeah, I tell everybody, write some blog posts or if you like to make videos or if you like to, you know, what you're doing, making a podcast is, is fantastic. I always encourage people to share their knowledge because it helps everybody. I mean, we all have a different way of seeing things. And uh, I learn a lot from blog posts of people who just say, you know what, I learned this and I'm going to write a blog post on this and link it to my GitHub or something. And I'm, I'm reading it and devouring it and I, and I, and I love it. So I'm always telling people to, to put their material out there. Yeah, as for me, it was a complete coincidence. I never thought I was going to have a YouTube channel. But when I was at Udacity, I, um, I started sending little videos of what I was going to do. So I, I, I had some ideas of like, okay, I want to put this little, I want to explain this this way, but the it was proof of quicker. concept for, for a video script of sorts. Sorry. Uh, what, what, were these like proof of concepts for video ideas? Uh, I did ask no, you. Ma- actually, when you look at one of the videos I have called a friendly introduction to machine learning, that was, ex- uh, that was meant to be full internal. Like I, I, I said it, okay, I have, a, I have some ideas on how to re-explain some of the concepts in machine learning. And I would tell people, hey, what about this? Hey, what about that? And be like, oh yeah, that's cool. But it would never sort of, I never gathered everybody at the same time for, for a while and tell them everything. So I thought that's, that's hard. People are busy. I'm just going to make a little video and put it, a, 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 I, I knew one thing of the recommendations, which is that if you have a channel with zero subscribers and you put a video on it, it's almost like having it in a, in a secure hard drive. Nobody <laughs> will get to it. <laughs> so I put it in my YouTube channel that didn't have videos or just had random things. And then I sent it to people in the company. Like I sent it to, to the VP and my director, my manager. And then uh, one of them, the, the VP thought it was uh, something we were doing in content and he retweeted it and he had a lot of followers. He just like tweeted it and, and when I saw it, I'm like, oh, okay, sure. Then I'll, and he said, yeah, they, they were encouraging. They're like, yeah, if you want to put your videos out there, go for it. I thought it would be like maybe restricted or something, but they said, uh, put it out and the video started getting views. And then I forgot about it. And then one day I logged into YouTube and I see my own video recommended to me. And I knew one of the uh, things I remember from being in the video team is that the, the pool of videos that get recommended is, is relatively small. Like you're not recommending every single YouTube video. You're restricting it to a, to a bunch that I already like trusted and have a bunch of views and things like that. So making it there, when I saw my own video recommended, like, whoa, it made it there. And I see views and it's like 3000. And I was like, whoa, how did this happen? So I thought, okay, if it, 
if it has, if it gets to 10,000, I make another one. And then it did. And I started making them occasionally and here and there, and it just kept, kept growing. So, so that's how it, that's how it started. Pure coincidence. That's also an amazing uh, end point to the interview because we started by talking about recommendation engines, but for the audience, I'd like to mention that uh, to date, I think you've taught around 3 million people through your channel. Of course, that was the around. numbers were never the intention. It was a side product for, for people listening to this podcast. I would encourage you to check out Lewis's channel, uh, maybe skip a few interviews. If you like, instead watch his videos, you'll, you'll learn a lot. Hopefully you'll come back to chat time data science as well. Uh, yes, and my, and my advice to them is also watch watch a lot of Chai Time data scientists because you got a lot of <laughs> cool interviews. So, <laughs> thanks so much. Yeah. Uh, apart from the YouTube channel, uh, what would be the other platforms where the people can connect with you that are listening to this podcast? If you're yeah, like they's, yeah, definitely. The, the easiest thing is Serrano Academy. That's my page where I try to put everything. So anything that's that's relevant, I have it there. So I have the book there. There's a discount code in the book there. I have. Um, yeah, you, YouTube, I have things normally on, on, on GitHub, but it's, if I do, they're probably related to a YouTube video, um, Twitter, they can connect me on Twitter. Uh, I'm very active there. LinkedIn, uh, I try to put things often and, and sort of get the word out there. And, and I have the occasional blog post on medium. So I, they can look at that. Uh, I, I think all of these profiles are uh, linked on Serrano Doc Academy. Uh, yep. Otherwise, Everything they'll be also there in the there. show notes for, for the audience at once. Thank you. Thank you so much, Luis, again, for joining me on the series. Thank you, Sanima, for having me. It's been a pleasure to talk to you. Thank you so much for listening to this episode. If you enjoyed the show, please be sure to give it a review or feel free to shoot me a message. You can find all of the social media links in the description. If you like the show, please subscribe and tune in each week to Chai Time Data Science.